Miller. On this week's episode of Tiger Turf Talk, we host Bill Deacon, Senior Director of Field Operations and Landscaping. Bill's a former boss of mine, uh, such an incredible person, um, someone who truly understands all aspects of the industry and what it takes to run a major league ballpark like City Field. We discuss different aspects of his career, how he started off uh, for passion in golf and attending school for horticulture, um, then going into the two-year program Penn State that's geared towards golf and finding his way into baseball through a connection uh, with the LA Dodgers and developing his career over time, working with some of the greatest minds in this industry, from Luke Yoder to Pete Flynn, being able to see not just the development of his own career, but the development of all these major league ballparks like Petco Park and now the City Field. Bill is a fantastic person to discuss infield care, uh, skin care of baseball fields. He is one of the best in the business. He has discussed different areas of how he's developed new and innovative products through his work at Shea Stadium before City Field and translating that into the new stadium. It is truly an amazing episode. I personally am so grateful for the opportunity that he gave me in New York uh, working with Matt um, and being able to develop my skills uh, with the Mets moving into different positions to where I am today. Another great thing we talk about is the impact that he's had on the industry with those who have worked with slash for uh bill in new york um seeing the development of people like matt brown and ryan woodley who are now the head groundskeeper uh, at pnc park in pittsburgh my former boss as well as uh, miller park in milwaukee with the brewers it, it's just a great episode and be sure to check it out we hope you enjoy this episode of Tiger Turf Talk. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 33rd episode of Tiger Turf Talk. I'm your host, Drew Miller. Today, we have an incredible guest, one of my former bosses, Mr. Bill Deacon, the head groundskeeper of the New York Mets. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great. How are you? Thanks. Thank you guys for having me. Oh, we're, we're so grateful that you came on. We're excited to get into it. Uh, we were just talking about it a little bit ago. Um, it's been a whirlwind of a start up in New York for you guys. Um, can you sort of talk to what preparation was like for the season this year um, and how the first couple home stands have been a little damp? Probably the best way to put it. Yeah, of course. So uh, this year, you know, typically we, we, um, we, we go back and forth every, every fall on when to put growth blankets on this year. We put them on in December. Um, last year we tried it, tried it too. It's a little earlier than normal for us. Um, typically we put them on January, February, but, uh, we, we were just, you know, we were having issues with, with wind and, and, uh, and, and snow and, you know, trying to time it out. So we got them on in December. Um, the, putting them on a little bit early leads to, you know, a little bit more tender turf when you take them off. But March was actually very kind to us this year. So we pulled them off uh, first week of March instead of a couple of weeks later. And, uh, and, and the grass kind of hardened off a little bit, uh, a little bit over, over that uh, be, before the season actually started first week, of April, we had what we would call a, a late opening day this year. So um, April, uh, April 6th, I believe it was. So, and, uh, and since, uh, so March was, March was great. You know, we had the grass green, everything was in, was in very good shape. Um, April came along and, uh, the rain came. So we first, first homestand, we had two, uh, two rainouts, uh, one suspended game, the suspended game, we got, uh, nine pitches thrown before we pulled the tarp. So, um, it's been, it, it was a rough first homestand. So hopefully it can only go up from there. Yeah, I was I was surprised they didn't consult you on that day, you know, just sort of like, hey, it's it's coming in. <laughs> Maybe not start the game, you know. Well, the the funny thing was is we had we had really light mist all all morning, and it was it was it was light enough to play in. So I was involved in that discussion, um, 
and then it just opened I, up where where we are it's 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 and it's not just us you know we're, we're in a tough spot because of because of the ocean and uh yeah it just kind of opened up at probably um two pitches in it just it just started pouring and the and after it did slow down again afterwards, but it was just uh, at that point, um, the ump- it's in the umpire's hands and they decided to, to cover it up. So. Absolutely. I remember when I was there, the, the tarp fiasco, I actually use it in my lessons to discuss like moisture <laughs> management and say, Hey, this is what happens when, <laughs> when things go wrong, you know? So uh, I, it's crazy to me again, how much the umpires play a role in everything. Um, and like you said, especially in New York, how it sort of just opens up because it, it did that day. I remember very vividly of everything that happened that day. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't a good day. Mm, so, <laughs> and it was, it's still funny to me because that was the, the 12 o'clock game, the only 12 o'clock game we had all season. And everybody's like, we might get out early. It's the end of a homestand. We're not covering after. And it just went, you know what? No, nah, we're not going with that yeah. plan. <laughs> um, so you were a part of probably one of the most, I don't know if weirdest is the right word for it, but last year with COVID, you were sort of left hanging in the balance when it came to when the season was starting, how it was going to start. And then you had spring training on site. Um, and then coming into this year, like you said, a late start, could you sort of discuss how last year compares to this year, even with COVID still as a major component of what you're doing, uh, maybe short staffed or stuff like that, or, different things that yeah. you could talk about. Yeah. So last year, uh, um, I remember, I remember distinctly it was uh third week of March and, and we sent everyone home. Um, you know, we, in, in New York landscaping, horticulture, agronomy is considered essential service. So we were able to work. Um, with that being said, the, the front office was closed and they didn't want, they didn't really want people at the ballpark. So it was really kept to a minimum. Um, it was just me. We had uh, two people out, outside on the landscaping, uh, our foreman and, and one of the, one of the full-time guys. And then we had uh, me and my two assistants just alternating days. We were trying, you know, never to overlap. So we, um, we really cut back on, on everything. Uh, if you, if you, if you saw the field in the middle of April, it was, you know, we had, we, we looked like, um, one of those little league fields that hadn't been worked on. We had ryegrass in the, in the baselines, uh, really all we were focusing on was we were fertilizing. Um, we bumped up our, our, our primo apps, our growth regulators, just to keep it regulated. And we were just fertilizing and mowing and, and, uh, you know, making sure that nothing happened with the grass. We were checking on it, uh, just really very, very minimal. We were, we were in there. We had people in there almost every day of the week, but it was, it was usually one person by themselves. So with that being said, we got, I asked for, you know, we, we were in constant communication throughout uh, COVID, but no one really knew what was going to happen with the season. So we got, I asked for, I said, we needed about a month to get ready. Um, And, uh, we were just getting to the point where the, the field was, the field was getting really tight and um, a little bit thatchy. So I, I was lucky enough to bring some guys back and we, we verified it. And then, uh, and then June hit and they said, um, we're going to start in three weeks. And we were like, well, we're starting with what? And then, so it was that little, little unknown of, of what was actually going to happen. Uh, you know, we, we didn't have protocols at that time. We had, we had seen little bits and pieces of it, but, uh, we weren't really sure. And then, and then we heard that spring training was coming. And then, uh, you know, as we prepared for spring training, the, the one thing that I will say is that our part-time staff really stepped up. Our full-time guys all came back, but our part-time staff really stepped up. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. We were, you know, we, we had people, we had crew starting at six and we had two shifts and, uh, we had people on the field to begin of spring training from eight in the morning till eight at night. So, and we were setting up uh, ground balls in the outfield. Um, you know, it was, it was, we had, we had portable mounds set up on the warning track. It, it was, you know, it was, there was 50 something people there uh, every day for the first, at least the first week. And then we went into um, it, it slowed down a little bit and we went into games, but it was still, you know, we'd have people there working out in the morning. Then we'd have a game at night. Um, so it was, uh, 
we were we were lucky that our our part time staff was was able to commit to some of this, and you know we just split it. <coughs> we just split everyone up and uh, and made the best of it. Um, the first little bit of spring training, there was a lot of the tarp was on for twelve days straight. It was you know it was we couldn't take a chance with people being out there at eight o'clock in the morning. So the field took a beating. Um, I will say that the way we've run events in the past where we've had a lot of events in that situation helped us out because we were able to recover pretty quickly from it. And I, I can only imagine again, taking 50 guys and saying, Hey, let's not tear up the field too much. You know, it, it, it's, it's gotta be impossible. Honestly. I mean, I can't imagine what you guys went through last year, just traffic wise expectations of keeping that standard what was the hardest part about that time where you had to keep that standard again for it's the MLB, obviously they expect it no matter what the circumstances, like you said, you host events. And even when I was there, there were events every day in the morning, afternoon, and Hey, there's a game tonight. Guess what? <laughs> Here's another curve bowl. We'll have three more tomorrow. You know, how was that for you guys? Uh, and like you said, with the staff being in, how are those guys doing by the way, how's eBay and all those guys. Everyone, everyone's there? doing great. That's good. That's awesome. They <laughs> yeah. hear um, yeah. Everyone. So it was, it, it was, um, the, really the hardest thing is like, I'm, I'm sure, sure it is where you guys are that, that time of year, July, you know, hot, humid, it's, it's not good bluegrass weather. Um, so we were taking, you know, a, a wear pattern that we'd never really seen before. Um, we were wearing spots out in the out. Like I said, we had, we had two infields set up in the outfield where they took round balls. Um, we were lucky that the grass was in great shape going in. Um, we did, you know, areas around home plate. We, we ended up having to saw it after spring training. It was just, you know, they, with, with the way we were set up, we were rolling the batting cage back onto to it. And there was just, there was a lot of people around and it was the, the home plate area took, took a beating and the back arc, the first little, little bit took a beating from having the tarp on. So it was putting the most wear we've ever had on the field at the worst possible time of the year. I mean, next to winter, obviously, but, um, so it was, you know, we couldn't get seed to germinate. We were trying, we, we tried everything. Um, and we ended up having to saw it a couple spots. Uh, the, the rest of the field actually came back pretty well. We, we went back to some, you know, I always, I, I go back to, to talking to some of my university professors and, you know, we, we kicked it back. We gave it a little ammonium sulfate, you know, a little quick release, tried to get it to, tried to get it to grow. And we just kind of pushed it through and uh, it worked out pretty well. That, and that's, it looks phenomenal throughout the entire season last year. And it looks amazing right now. Uh, Prime again for another season. Uh, you were sort of talking about it right there where you go back to your professors back in college. You are a graduate of the two year program at Penn state, correct? Yes. Could you sort of speak to how your education kind of prepared you, especially since you were, it's, it's a golf centered uh, background in the program, I believe if I'm correct. Right. Yes. Yeah. How did that prepare you to get to this point in your career where you're, you're one of the 32 that have these jobs that no one else has, you know, how did that get you to this point in your career? So I actually, when uh, I worked on a golf course, when I was in high school, it was, you know, it, it I started out when I was 14, it started a summer job. And, uh, then I realized, you know, you, you, uh, it, it started out really just, you know, I was weed whacking around the clubhouse and, and doing, doing stuff, doing stuff like that. And then, um, every summer I got progressively, uh, more involved with what was going on. I had a great superintendent and a great assistant superintendent. And when, when I finished high school, I was one of those, those kids that I, I just, you know, they, a lot of times you get sort of pushed towards academic roads and it just, it, it really wasn't for me. So I, uh, I stayed, I worked on the golf course an extra two years. And then I kind of discovered horticulture and I was like, Oh, I can get it. I, I was, I was one of those, I, I didn't know you could get a degree in that. So I went to horticulture school in Niagara Falls. Um, and, uh, and that really prepared me for actually taking the two-year course. And that was one of the reasons why I took the two-year course. Um, I, I finished horticulture school and I worked in Vancouver and I had a little taste of athletic fields out there. 
<laughs> but I really had every intention of going back into golf. And, uh, so I, I picked the two years, picked the two year, uh, course at Penn state. Um, I was a little bit older at that time. So I, I, uh, I wanted to get it done as quick. I wanted basically, you know, as much turf focused, um, courses as I could and cram it into as little time as possible. And, uh, and that's really what the, the two-year program does. You don't, you, you miss a lot of the, if a lot of the, the Englishes and stuff like that, and you focus really on turf and soil and, and it's, it's really geared towards that. Um, when I was going to school, I, like I said, I had every intention of going back into golf and, uh, I was looking at internships and I said, why don't I just try baseball? And, uh, so I looked around, I, I contacted a few different people. Um, I'm originally from the West coast. So I wanted to go back out West. I wanted to, one, I wanted to work on warm season grass and two, I just wanted an opportunity to learn infield dirt, mound, clay, you know, what goes into it. And, and, uh, I really just, I, I interviewed with, uh, Eric Hansen at the Dodgers at that time. And, uh, he, he really, um, he, he's, he, he, took what I said and, and he really kind of let me run with it. Um, you know, I was, I worked with the game staff. I, I, I did all the shifts they had there, different shifts. So I got to see everything that went on and, uh, I really got to spend a lot of time focused on, uh, on the infield dirt and the mound and, and really learn that aspect of, uh, of, 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 field maintenance. And I found that I really enjoyed it. And, and I went back to school, Penn state finished out the two-year course. And then I started just uh, looking for jobs in baseball at that point. And, and that's what I sort of want to segue into next. You work with some of the greatest minds in baseball, even baseball focus, but sports turf industry overall. Um, could you sort of speak to your journey? You just said like you started off in LA um, I know you've worked, we've had Luke on and you've worked with a couple other big names that, uh, I believe you work with Pete Flynn. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Back at city, uh, back, Shea, whoa, don't say yeah. that back at Shea stadium. Um, could you sort of talk about your journey and what it was like to get to this point where you're at city field now? Yeah, of course. Um, so when I finished, finished at Penn state, I was looking at different jobs and, uh, Eric Hansen, like I said before, from the Dodgers was very, was very influential. And, uh, one of the things he told me was he said, I was, I was asking him, I said, should I try it? I had a triple a offer as an assistant or, you know, a single a or a, or an independent league as a, as a head. And he said, take the head groundskeeper spot. He said, you'll be nervous. He said, but a lot of times in those jobs, he said, you're going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. But he said, a lot of times it forces you really to um, look at how you're doing things, figure out where, where you can cut corners and where you can save time. Um, you manage your own budget. He said, like I, like I said, he said, you're going to make mistakes, but you'll learn from them. And uh, he said, that's in his opinion, that was the best way to prepare yourself. Um, and so I just, I just kind of took that and, uh, I went, I worked in the independent league. Um, it was tough. I'm not going to lie. It was tough, but it, it was, it was in New York. And so I got to experience weather, um, small staff. It was me and me and two seasonal guys. And then me and two, uh, two game staff guys for games. And then we would just pull from, uh, <coughs> pull from the interns and, and pull from, uh, the office interns and the office staff to do other things. Um, and while I was there, I also got to experience, we, we did soccer on our baseball field. So that helped prepare me for down the road with, with events and stuff like that. Um, when, uh, while I was there, Eric had jobs open up at Dodger stadium. So I actually went back to Dodger stadium after that, um, spent a couple of years there. And while I was there, they were building Petco and, uh, you know, we were, the, the big question when I first got back was, well, who's going to, who's going to get the job at Petco? Because then, you know, we were all like, well, whoever gets the head job there, you know, then, then we can, uh, we can look at who's going to be assistant. So Luke came up to San to uh, LA when he got the job and he was looking at our infield dirt 
And at that time, I first expressed to him, I said, you know, when, when you start looking for assistance, I, I want to put my name in the hat. And, uh, and so I interviewed with Luke and uh, I was fortunate enough to get there in uh, at the end of 2003. And so I was there for the opening of Petco. I saw I, the field was already in, but, you know, I, I kind of got to experience some of the grow in and then uh, experience opening a, opening a new ballpark there, which, uh, which helped me down the road when we opened city. And then uh, while I was there, I, I planned on staying in San Diego for much longer, but um, the Mets actually called uh, looking for asking if they could interview someone. And, uh, and so uh, I, I jumped at that chance figuring, you know, there's only so many jobs, so many big league jobs. Um, so I jumped at that chance and, and was fortunate enough to get the, the, uh, the Mets job, uh, um, working at Shea. And while I was at Shea, Pete Flynn was there. He was, uh, he was retired from being the head groundskeeper, but he was still, still working there. Just if you, if you knew Pete, he, his, uh, it was really just his passion. And, you know, he, uh, he didn't want to be in charge anymore. He just wanted to come in every day and, and sort of, so I, I learned some stuff from him learned as well. And, uh, you know, picked his brain. Um, and then I was lucky enough to, we were just starting construction, uh, the planning of uh, city field. So I, I, I kind of got in on the ground floor there and I was able to, uh, to, to put my two cents in to uh, some of the things that I wanted to see done uh, when we built the new ballpark. And it's, it's, uh, there are so many layers to it and we've actually discussed it with a couple different people. Um, Leah Withrow is doing one out at Reno right now. We actually were talking during the week of, um, could you sort of speak to what that was like, uh, to again, be the person that you get to put your two cents in probably about materials, uh, specs, all the different aspects that you learned, with Luke when you were in San Diego um, and maybe how it sort of differed in the sense of maybe the stadium structure, weather, cool season versus warm season grass. Um, What was it that you were looking for and how did that go? And now, again, it's crazy to say it's been over 13 years now since it opened. Um, How have you seen those things have an impact on how you now are caring for your field? So I guess the, the, the beginning of city field really starts at Shea. I, uh, when I got to Shea, um, one of the big, big, uh, things that I was tasked with was fixing the infield dirt. Um, there was, there was issues with it. And, uh, I, I essentially took some of the testing that we'd done. I asked Eric Hansen for, for the test on his and Luke, at that point we had the same dirt in San Diego as LA. Um, so I was really just looking at those specs and I was calling around. Um, I called the, the manufacturer of the original infield dirt at Shea and, um, he, he wasn't, he didn't really want to, want to, want to work with us on, on changing it. And so I called around and I was able to, um, only one other person had, had amended infield dirt. That was the other thing was they told me you can, you can fix it, but you can't rip it out and replace it. So, um, we came up with, with an amendment. Um, now it's, it, it wasn't my idea. It was, uh, the company I worked with Duredge. Um, at that time we just had, we just had bags of, uh, of, of different samples that we were looking at and, uh, and running them through Norm Hummel. And, um, it's, it's what's essentially now called field saver, um, so that's what we did. We added clay and silt to the infield at Shea and it was, it was very successful. Um, the, the players, the players really enjoyed playing on it. We got a ton of compliments. And, uh, so that's kind of how we came up with what we were going to do at city field. The, the first thing that we, we discussed was infield, infield mix. Um, and we came up with, with what we have now. Um, it's slightly, slightly more clay than, than a typical pro mix, but, um, it holds together really well. It plays well in the rain. And it was, you know, those, those are the things we were kind of looking at. Uh, the, the general construction, I was, I was lucky enough that, um, our, our previous owner was a big believer in sub air. 
Um, so we were able to, from, from the beginning, we installed a sub air system, which is uh, hugely helpful for us uh, during rain. Um, we also have heat hooked up to it so we can uh, use like a forced air heating system. It's, it doesn't work like hydronic heat, but, uh, but it does, you know, it does help out in, uh, in January, February, just to try and slowly boost the temperatures up, which it actually um, helps the plant just, you know, instead of shocking it, you're just kind of slowly <coughs> trying to bring it out of dormancy. Um, it would be nice if it worked a little quicker, but uh, it, it does what we need it to do really. Um, and obviously that's, that's part of our, our, sub air has become part of our cultural practices where we're constantly pushing and pulling air through the, through the root zone. So with that being said, because of the sub air, that's essentially how our drainage was designed. We have um, our drain pipes are much tighter than, well, five feet tighter than on center than an average field because um, it was part of the sub air specs for evenly distributing the air throughout the, throughout the uh, root zone. Um, Root zone, we, we picked a local company, um, a very, very standard. It was a 90, 10, um, you know, I go back and forth sometimes if, if I had to do it again, I might go a little bit less peat. Um, but you know, it's, it's worked out well for us. Um, I'm trying to think sod I've, I've, uh, on the East coast, I've always used, uh, used Takaho. Um, <clears throat> our, var our varieties now are completely different than what we started with. Um, a lot of that just comes based on availability, but, uh, um, I'm, I'm always very happy with, with how they, uh, how they grow their sod, how they cut their sod, um, and how they install it. And then, uh, you know, we didn't, not every aspect of the field construction went exactly the way I wanted it to. Um, you know, there are things and it, it, I shouldn't say construction because it was more design issue. There are, there are um, a couple little things here and there that, uh, that I didn't win out, went out on because, you know, as when you're building a, a new ballpark costs come into, and uh, so there are certain things, you know, our warning track mix is, is uh, we've amended that as well. Um, it was a very fine material that worked really well. And then we've been amending it with a co more coarse material to, uh, to let water flow through it a little bit better. But uh, our slope on our warning track isn't what I requested. I wanted to slope everything to the wall. We've kind of over time flattened it out a little bit. And, uh, and we use the, you know, we use the fact that water runs through it to drain it rather than push it anywhere. But, uh, you know, overall it was a very positive experience. And the other thing that was, that was um, really interesting was, you know, I got to, I got to be there from the start as far as um, shops and break rooms and, and uh, equipment and all that stuff. So that was, that was also, um, you know, uh, a, a great experience. I learned a lot from uh, of that aspect from Luke. Um, he helped, he kind of walked me through a lot of it, what we did in San Diego. And I took a lot of that stuff and, and, uh, and was able to use a lot of that, um, those ideas and different things because, the one thing you find when you're building something like that is it's overwhelming. And we were trying to maintain the field at Shea and going back and forth to construction meetings at city, even though it was across the parking lot, it was just, you know, you're trying on a, on a regular game day, you're trying to manage the field at Shea and then, and then as well, sit in on construction meetings and make sure, you know, nothing gets missed in that. So Luke was, uh, even, he probably doesn't know it, but he, he, he was hugely instrumental in, in helping me through that. We won't let them know. <laughs> um, so you sort of discussed it and uh, both you and Luke are huge on infield clay. You actually gave a presentation this year at STMA. I watched it. It was fantastic. Um, what was it that brought you sort of to the infield? Like what, why? And again, you were always working on it when I was there. And again, everyone says you were one of the best to ever do it. Um, and what's really cool what you said is being a part of the fact that Dura edge is now sort of the standard in the MLB, you know, that's the, your, your clay that you helped create with them is now the standard. What was that sort of like and how those experiences sort of brought the industry to where it is today? Um, if that makes sense, I'm sorry if that was poorly worded. No, that's, I, I completely understand. So 
<coughs> when when uh, when I first started, that was something that kind of Eric Hansen instilled in me was uh, he said, if, if you're going to work in baseball, you got to figure out you, you got you got to make the infield uh, infield play well. And um, Will Schnell, who ended up uh, being the Rose Bowl superintendent for a long time, he was actually Eric's assistant when I was in uh, in L.A. the first time. And uh, Will was also, you know, he he understood a lot of that stuff and he was great at explaining it. Um, I made a few mistakes along the way and he was kind enough to to uh, <laughs> help me through a lot of that stuff. But that was just really something that that uh, that Eric kind of uh, instilled in me. And, you know, it was always remember, this is this is where the ball bounces. And, and Eric was always as when I was an intern, no matter what shift I worked, he would he would tell me he's like, you know, you have to you have to watch BP. You got to watch the ball bounce on the dirt. And he was very, very particular. And uh, when when I went to San Diego, we had the same dirt. And that was, um, you know, Luke and I talked a lot about it. And, and he he was uh, he was, you know, he said, well, you've worked with it. Let's work together on this. And, uh, you know, I, I got to spend a lot of time just every day working on the infield dirt, working on the infield dirt. And uh, when I when I moved to to Shea, I knew the infield mix they used to have because I had it in the independent league um, and I knew what I could do with it. And I knew kind of its limitations. So I knew we could make it play. Okay. And there's really only, I've, I've seen it play, play well. And there's really only um, a couple of people that it's, I guess, can, can make that infield mix play well. And it's got a very fine line. It's not very forgiving, I guess. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that I did was I took the specs from, uh, from what we had in, in California. And I was like, let's, let's try this in, in New York. And, um, I can't take credit for coming up with field save or anything. Um, it was, there were, there, it was in Philly before, before we had it. Um, but, uh, um, Grant McKnight, when, when we first looked at my soil tests, he said, send me your soil tests. And that was one of the first things I did was I tested the infield mix and we first looked at it and we both looked at it and we said, well, you need more clay and silt in here. And we were, you know, hundred percent in agreement. And he, he said, I'll make you the product. And, you know, we, we kind of figured out how to do it. And like I said, the product performed so well as an amendment that immediately right then we're like, this is what's going in the new ballpark. Um, it was, it, it was, I went down to spring training in, in 2006 before my first season and met with the manager and some of the players about the infield. And after the first workout, they called me in and said, what, what happened to the infield dirt? And I was like, Oh no, here we go. And they were like, no, it's outstanding. It's great. And, uh, so that was, that, that made our decision very easy. And then as the season progressed and we saw how it performed in the rain and, you know, little things like that. And it, it does have a learning curve. I'm not going to lie. You know, we did make our mistakes with it, but, uh, um, once we saw, you know, overall how we, how many things, you know, how, it, like I said, how it performed in the rain, how we could, um, get more events in and, and stuff like that. It was a no brainer really to put it in the, in the new ballpark. And, you know, it's, uh, I go back to when I worked in the independent league, I saw Paul Zwaska talk about, um, do a, do a talk on sand silt clay and different conditioners. And, you know, it was, it was just always something that I really enjoyed and I enjoyed exper experimenting with and trying different things. And, you know, we've, we've, tried different conditioners. We went away from those conditioners. We went back to, and, you know, it's, it's just something that I feel like we're always, we're always trying to improve and we're always trying to work on. And it's, it's great being able to talk to people about stuff like that and get little ideas from other people and take them back and try them as well. And I think, I think that's one of the best things about this industry is the, the, the back and forth and the always adapting to something new. And I think that's, what's, that's crazy to see, especially again, you're talking about from LA to New York and then making those adaptations to make it better. Um, sort of to switch gears. Um, it sort of goes with what you were talking about with developing the new stadium and whatnot, but 
even today, your role is way bigger than just the um, game day fields, just field work. You do way more than that. Um, when it comes to operations, you're part of a bigger conglomerate, if that's the right word. I don't know what I'm saying, really. Um, <laughs> could you sort of discuss what your job entails on top of just taking care of the field? Um, I know you had many meetings in the time that I was there and these are on game days. So it's like you have 15 different things as well as the game that night. Uh, could you sort of explain your role and how that's sort of changed over the years? Yeah. Um, so th I guess the first part that most people don't know is that, that uh, I also, I, as well as the field, I oversee the landscaping. Um, when we first got to city field, the first year that the landscaping fell under the, the contractors and we, and after that, I took over managing the contractors in 2012, <clears throat> we were, you know, we were trying to figure out different ways to improve the landscaping. It was, it was a, it was a very generic design, a lot of grass, a lot of, um, a lot of ornamental grasses, uh, and we, and, a ton of, um, of annual, annual plantings. And we were trying to make it a little bit cheaper on the annual plantings and then just bring more overall color to the, to the, uh, to the ballpark. So at that point we did a, a cost analysis and decided to bring it in house. And we hired, um, a director of horticulture and she reports to me and we sort of created this landscape team that works outside. Um, and the went from, from, uh, from opening day 2009 till now, it's unbelievable the difference, and they do such an outstanding job. So that's that's part of my role as well is uh, is the whole landscape, um, and then you know which I'm I'm lucky that uh, you know I have great people working out there. So it I I spend a lot of time managing it from afar, which is great. It makes it a lot easier. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we get a lot of compliments about, uh, about the exterior of the ballpark as well. So then, um, the, the, the next biggest part that, that a lot of people don't, don't know, or, or don't understand is, is sort of the event event structure. Um, we spend a lot of time meeting about events. Uh, it's, it's this last year and this year, it's a little bit different because we, we aren't having any, so we're, we're full. Well. I'm sure we'll have some down the road as the ballpark become as the state ballpark becomes more open, but right now we're not having any events. So we're focusing more on cultural practices, but I would say that's the majority of stuff we do outside of, uh, outside of, of field work is, is just different events. And, um, just like a, a typical day in, in our schedule would be, uh, usually once during a homestand, we would have a corporate VP in the morning. Um, I, when the homestands, when they're out of town, we've had everything from soccer, lacrosse, uh, concerts to on a regular basis, we play, we play softball in the outfield. Um, we set up two fields in each corner and, and, uh, and play. And so we, we really, in the off season, I focus a lot on, on setting up that schedule so that we can still get maintenance days in. And I try and as best we can, obviously pre-plan our maintenance. Um, the weather has a little bit of an effect on that. You know, we typically between homestands, we try and take two days on one end, two days on the other for maintenance. Um, a lot of the times we end up with one end, one day on the, on the after homestand and two days before. And, uh, it, it just, it just really, um, we spend a lot of time on that. And I think that's why we're able to handle the events is because we do spend a lot of time with that stuff and pre-planning it so that, um, for the most part, as, as stuff's going on, we're prepared for it. Um, I, I always like to say, you know, we're the, the way our staff is set up, we're always prepared for, um, a crisis situation. If, if it's, a if it's a sunny day in August with no rain and no, no events on the field, then, you know, it's, it's, it's usually, um, it's usually a very, uh, a little bit easier day, but we're always prepared just in case, um, in, in case there is a crisis. And that's what helps us get through a lot of this other stuff. Like, like I said, last year with spring training, it's what helped us, 
um, get through having summer patch under the tarp in the middle of July. So never fun, never fun with that. <laughs> um, so, and you sort of discussed it, how you have a director of horticulture, which by the way, again, it's incredible. The, the grounds around the stadium that you, that you guys have kept. And then uh, I still keep in touch with, I think Alex is still there. Am I wrong in saying that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Keep in touch with Alex. And uh, again, he's working all the time, uh, snaps me and whatnot. So it's, it's incredible the work that goes on outside the stadium as much as inside, you know, um, with that, you rely on certain people. And when I was there, it was Matt was the assistant, is assistant the right term? I'm saying. Yeah. That. Okay. So Matt the was the assistant. Okay. And then, uh, Ryan, uh, after him when he went to Pittsburgh, is that correct as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is it that you're looking for in those people in order to have faith in that they're going to meet your standards, the standards of the MLB, uh, the standards outside having those, uh, again, the continuous uh, greatness outside the stadium. What is it you're looking for to ensure that that will continue on, uh, especially seeing, again, that transition from Matt to Ryan and now Ryan's gone. Is Andrew the assistant now? Is that? And so So now we have, uh, we actually have two. And, oh, okay. And, and Andy and Tim. Tim Andy wasn't sorry. there when you were there, but Tim, Tim was I was there. talking about Tim. I don't know why I said Andrew. Yeah. Is his last name Andrew McAndrews? Yes. Okay, that's where it was. How's and Tim then Andy Be- So there's Andy Beggs and there's uh, and there's Tim McAndrew. Gotcha. So we have we actually have two now. That's awesome. um, and that came about because last year before um, COVID hit, we were actually supposed to play a full soccer schedule. So um, that's that's how that kind of came about. But when when we're looking to fill those spots. One of the things that um, we try and do is we try and hire people into onto the crew that have some court, some, some sort of experience (coughs) or that we're familiar with. Um, And our goal is to take the people from the crew, move them and gradually move them up, um, move them from a crew member to a foreman spot. And then eventually if we have op- other openings, then into some of the, some of those other openings. So when, when, uh, when Ryan first came to work for us, Ryan was actually working in Trenton and he came to the all-star game just to help, help out. And uh, he was actually one of the first ones that said, we, we were just talking about how to progress in major league baseball and my, my feelings always been, you have to have a combination of minor league baseball experience and major league baseball experience. And Ryan had a ton of minor league experience, but he didn't have any major league experience. So he said, you know, I, if you have an opening on the crew, I, I'm, you know, I understand it's a completely different role. And sometimes it's, it's difficult. We have had people come before that have been head groundskeepers and it's difficult to move from a head groundskeeper to a crew member. It, it takes someone that understands sort of the big picture and, and wants to progress and wants to get that experience to hopefully move, move on. Um, when, when I first took this job, one of the, one of the things that, that I talked about that I'd gotten from Eric Hansen and from Luke was I want to hire people that, that want to do what I want to do or want to move into, you know, a similar role somewhere else. Um, I feel like that way you're getting, you're getting people with great experience and people that are, are going to continually work to um, improve really. And that's, that's um, one of the things that I've learned over the years is, you know, just when you think you have everything figured out is when something comes back and, you know, bites you. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things where you're always continually trying to improve and it's not always like, it's, I consider it a feather in our cap that both Matt and Ryan have moved on and, and, you know, they were entrusted to, to take over uh, major league ballparks. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with coaches and players recognizing that we're doing a good job. Um, So it's, it's, you know, it's almost like a pat on the back as far as that goes. But I also, um, you know, I also look at uh, a lot of our former interns and people that have moved on to do other things too. And, you know, one of the things that I always tell people is that, you know, Major League Baseball might not be, might not be what, what 
is your passion, but a lot of times you can learn a lot of things and take it to something else. Um, and, you know, we've had, we've had, uh, interns that have moved on and they're, and they're taking care of, you know, 400 acre parks and stuff like that. And, you know, there's a lot of times people look at it and they see, oh, there's only 30, you know, 32 jobs and or 30 jobs. And there's only this many NFL jobs, but there's really so much more out there. And, uh, you know, you really have to find your, find your niche in the industry. And, you know, it's, uh, sometimes it's major league baseball. Sometimes it's, you know, there's, there's people in minor league baseball that have jobs that, uh, that are outstanding as well. It's, you know, it, it's really about finding what, you know, where your passion is and, and what really fits for you too. And, and that's something that we try to do here is to, again, we talk about how if turf is something you want to do, it can take you anywhere you want to be in the world. It can be whatever level you want to do. If you want to go and work in professional baseball, you just have to work your ass off to get there. Pardon my French. But um, with all that, um, sort of to go with that, you sort of spoke to how they both moved up, both Matt and Ryan. Could you sort of speak to what it means to you to sort of be that mentor? Um, and again, you and I never met before I got to New York for the game day staff job. Uh, it was Matt who hired me. And I still remember the first day when I'm sitting at the gate and I made you come out. I'm like, I just made him come out and get me. I felt like so bad. I was like, he's probably got better things to do than come get me out here. Cause Matt wasn't responding. But how do you have that point to where again, you can trust Matt's judgment to bring someone from Virginia all the way up to New York to work a summer, you know, what is it that, that role as a mentor means to you and how important is it to you to sort of inspire that next generation of groundskeepers? That a, a lot of that comes from, um, so like I said, working with Eric and Luke and Will, <coughs> um, they kind of, a, a lot of that comes from them. You know, it was, Eric was the one that, that first told me, he's like, you know, he said, I always try and hire people that, that want my job because I feel like they're going to, they're going to really work for it and they're going to work hard at it. And they're usually pretty passionate about it. And it's uh, it once, once you figure out, you know, how um, you know, how those, how those people work a lot of times, you know, my, my management style is I like, I, I like to um, I like to, to give people things to do. And I like, them to learn how to, how to do those things and gradually increase, um, increase responsibilities. I feel like people work better when they're not being, you know, not being stood over and, uh, and told, Oh, you got to do this. You got to change that. You know, a lot of times you learn, you learn very well on your own. And, um, I try and guide people and I try and ask, uh, make, make them ask questions and, uh, and, and try and, um, really have them, focus on making decisions. And, you know, if I, if I disagree with the decision, you know, I'll, I'll tell them, you know, I, I think it's probably, that's probably not the best way to do things. And, you know, between Matt and I and Ryan and I, and, and even Andy and Tim at this point, and, you know, we, we had our, we had our, we definitely had our disagreements about, about different things. And I'm sure Matt in Pittsburgh has things that he took from us that he does. He has took things that he took from Luke and, and he has things that, you know, he he's done on his own that, that um, differ from the way we did things. But I think part of establishing that trust is the biggest thing is letting people work on their own and really, you know, just kind of guiding them a little bit so that they, they really learn. And, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's funny because Matt and Ryan, if, if you, if you look at the way they handled the position, they're two completely different people, um, but both equally uh, great results. And Andy and Tim right now, same thing. They're, the two of them are polar opposites, but um, equally great results. And, you know, there's, there's times where I'll, I'll step in and I'll say, no, this is, this is what we're doing. Like, you know, enough, this is what we're doing. But I, I, I do, try and, and let people make their own decisions and work on their own and, you know, and, and just try and guide them a little bit. And, 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 you know, they're, like I said before, people make mistakes. It happens. You, you just have to, the most important thing is you learn from your mistakes and, and you move on from them. Yeah, absolutely. And 
we do plenty of mistakes at Brentsville, so <laughs> <laughs> myself included. We'll we'll make sure we put that in there. Um, I again, one more shift. Uh, with everything that you're focusing on, uh, and again, you sort of discussed worried about summer patch. Uh, it gets hot in New York, and uh, it's it's kind of not really the best space for Kentucky bluegrass uh, during that time frame. What are you focusing on, uh, culturally speaking, cultural practices, uh, when it comes to the 82 games, uh, aerating, are you verticutting? What are you focusing on, and how have you seen that sort of change over time? So um, aerification for, for us is huge. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, you know, we're, we're trying to aerify as much as possible um, without going overboard, obviously. So we came kind of came up with a schedule over time when spring and fall, if, if we have a seven to eight day break, we can pull small cores, um, half inch three eighths and still recover in enough time or else, you know, we can do some kind of slicing time, some kind of solid time. Um, when we have a 10 day break, we try and do something bigger, like a five eighths inch, um, a three quarter time. And, we, uh, typically, typically when we, when we airify with just our, our regular machine, we'll just, we'll pick all the cores up, um, do a pretty heavy top dressing. And, and, you know, we, every time we poke some kind of hole, we top dress. Um, I, I'm a big believer in, in keeping the, the surface firm. And I also feel like you can keep the grass a little bit taller, um, and have it still play fast by keeping it firm with, with uh, top dressing. And then um, the other thing, and, and we didn't do this last year, but if, if our field gets more than a couple of years old, we try and do a deep time. Um, just the, the constant pounding of the air fire in that four inch. And we, we have a little compaction meter that, that uh, Andy and Tim will run out there and they'll, and they'll read the, com and they'll take the compaction and, and we'll find that when we don't deep time, we do get a compaction at about the four inch layer. So this year we have a deep time set up in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're actually going to do a vert core. So we're going to pull a seven, eight inch core. When we do that, a lot of times we'll drag the sand in because the sand from, you know, below the, the four inch line is, is in, it's beautiful sand really once we start pulling it up. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's the main part of our cultural practices. Obviously, um, you know, when, as, as funny as it sounds, one of the things that we added in the last couple of years was grinders, which has helped us having a constantly sharp reel. And it's not that we weren't sharp before, but it's, uh, it's just, you know, when, when it's easier to keep your reel sharp, you're going to sharpen them much more. And, uh, and having a sharp reel, I feel like helps us, especially, you know, our ryegrass doesn't tear. It keeps, you know, keeps the clean cut hopefully helps keep the fungicide down a little bit. So between that and then, um, and then running the sub air, we run the sub air constantly, uh, during the season, it's probably three times a day. We're on a 40 minute cycle and, uh, and I just space it out evenly. And it's just to constantly keep oxygen moving through the, through the root zone. Um, and then last year, actually during, during, uh, COVID the, because we were, spraying our, our regular regulators at a higher rate um the, the field got really really tight last year so we we uh we groomed it with with like a light i would call it a light verticut heavy groom and uh we did that at the end of the season and the results were outstanding so we're thinking of incorporating that a little bit more it was something i would i would get very afraid to do because you know with as you get hotter and the bluegrass gets more tender I didn't want to rip it up too much when, when I worked on Bermuda, you know, that's, that's all we did was rip the Bermuda up, but, um, we're, we're going to try and incorporate, you know, like a, like a little bit more of a grooming practice into, into, um, into our cultural practices this year. And it'll be like a spring and fall thing and depending on weather really. But, uh, the only other thing with aerification is as it gets really, really hot, then we kind of back off a little bit and we go to more, like I said, a, a slicing tine or something like that. That's less invasive. So you were talking a little bit about uh, with sub air and the compaction meter, 
could you sort of speak to some of the technology that you you're using? I remember when I was there, you can control irrigation from your phone. We were marking heads and I remember you just went through the zones on your phone. I got hit in the back once. It was pretty funny, but um, obviously we're working off boxes for high school, <coughs> obviously. So what is that technology at the MLB level that you're using and continually changing to better your cultural practices? So the, the, I guess the biggest, um, you know, we've had the sub air all along. One of the, one of, one of our, um, our newest, I guess it was probably last year. We we've always checked moisture readings and we've always had, had, uh, you know, kind of looked at our moisture levels. Um, we bought a cloud-based system and it, 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 it makes everything unbelievably easy. So now we take readings almost every day. Um, unless we know it's, and we take them on the, in the grass, in the dirt, um, we've tried the mound and it's really just to help us, um, help us, uh, be more efficient with our water. You know, it's, uh, one of the, one of the things, another thing that I've learned over time is, you know, it's, it's easy during the season, you get into the habit of, you know, okay, it was hot today. It was windy. Um, let's just click the aeration on. So, you know, we're, we're trying to, to spend much more time just looking at moisture levels and, and making more informed decisions. And, you know, there's times where we'll take readings at two and a half inches and everything looks great. And we'll come in the next morning and it's really windy. It's been windy all night and the grass is, uh, is wilting and, you know, we'll have to adjust like that, but, um, it's, I, I feel like, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things It's very, very easy to overwater. And, uh, you know, so we're trying to do our best with, with, with something like that, a moisture meter. And I mean, it reads salinity, it reads temperature. We don't have a salt problem. Um, we're lucky temperature. We, we really focus on in the spring and fall, um, just to try and some time out some of our, uh, some of our, app, our fertilizer applications. Um, last year, because we were in COVID and, you know, we really, we really tried to nail down, uh, doing, doing, uh, um, primo apps on growing degree days. It was something that it, it, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously something it's been a, a topic for the last few years. And until we started, I, I always looked at it, but I never really, never really understood, I guess, you know, I'm like, I don't understand why you want to, why do you want to spray more? And then, um, I talked to one of my old interns and he really explained it to me. And I was like, Oh, that makes perfect sense. And it was just something that, um, you know, we tried last year and we had great success. So we're going to do it again. Um, with our schedule, it doesn't always work out, but we try and get it, you know, try and get it close. Um, and it's just another example of, of constantly, constantly trying to learn and constantly trying to get better. Uh, the, the compaction meter was something we bought, um, off of Granger and we bought it just to check, uh, check after uh, a concert, you know, after we put a stage on the field, what, what everything was like. And, you know, that's Tim kind of was the one that kind of discovered that, wow, at four inches, we're really compacted here. So let's, uh, and then we, you know, let's try and deep time a little more often. And so I, I it's, it's just some of that stuff. Um, the, the one thing that I'm, I'm still trying to figure out is how we can, how we can measure ball bounce. You know, it's, it's, uh, I've, I've seen tools that can, that, that, uh, that have been used, but it's something that I would love to, you know, be able to say, listen, you can, you can pull data from, cause major league baseball has all, has all the, the pitch tracking data. You can pull data about where the ball bounces, but I would love to see, you know, on a consistent basis, how high is that ball bouncing? You know, if it hits the grass first, you know, and things like that. Um, so there's still, there's still a ways to go with, with stuff like that, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things I find very interesting and, uh, and would love to learn more about. And I just try and keep, uh, you know, look, looking for suggestions and, and trying different things as far as that goes. That would be awesome to have somebody come up with, I mean, I'm sure they could do it with the trajectory and whatnot, figure out the force of the ball on the ground based on the angles and whatnot. I'm not going to figure it out, but I mean, <laughs> don't, don't bring me back to geometry um, uh, with everything and your career. And it's, it's an incredible career with everything you've accomplished and everything you've done and still are doing. Um, 
I mean, you've worked World Series, All Star games, concerts are a huge part of it. Was there ever anything that stuck out that was like kind of like that wow moment where you had to like take a second for yourself? Um, I know you're a big hockey guy and you probably will hate me for this story, but I remember at the World Series, I was sitting in the the whole uh, watching, I think it was college football. I think it was Ohio State versus uh, Penn State. It was your guys' game, yours and Matt. Uh, and these three guys walk in and – they were Rangers and I didn't know they were Rangers. <laughs> and somebody came running like those were the Rangers. I'm like, yeah, they've been sitting here for like 10 minutes and I didn't know who they were. <laughs> so we were just talking, but what was that moment like? And do you remember what time what that was? So I, as far as baseball goes, the first real moment for me, but with baseball, um, you know, was, was in, in two, I, I was lucky enough in 2006 to, uh, my first year when I came to the Mets was uh, experienced a, a deep playoff run, and people people always talk about how the how the stands used to used to uh, move up and down at Shea, and it was that when uh, you know when it, you look back and and uh, you know we went to Game Seven of uh, of the NLCS that year, and that was that was unbelievable. And we hosted Game Seven. It was in a drizzling rain. It was all the conditions you didn't want, but it was if you look back, it was such an outstanding game. And then, um, you know, experience Johan Santana throwing a, a no hitter was, was great. Um, you know, I got to experience that. Um, and then more, you know, more recently, um, I, my wife was able to bring my son to when we made the world series, the only, only home game, the Mets won. So, um, Rough, rough and then, and then, yeah <laughs> the world the world series is is unbelievable i can only imagine what it's like to, to win you know um and then there's there's other things like for for me um i was lucky enough I, when i worked for the dodgers i used to work part-time at the rose bowl and um you know anyone that loves college football loves loves the rose bowl and uh as funny as it sounds, I, I, I painted painting the rose at the Rose Bowl for the first time was outstanding. That was a lot of fun. I got to see Penn State play there. I, I got to see Ohio State play there. Um, it was I was there for a national championship game. Uh, so it was that that was that was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of work, but a lot of fun. And then uh, you know, I we we had the Winter Classic at uh, at City Field. So I was able to, you know, my, my sister and, and, uh, her husband came out and my wife and my son came to the game. So that was, that was a lot of fun too. You know, it's, it's things like that. You, you look back and, and, uh, you, it makes, it makes you feel lucky that, you know, you're, you're able to involve your family in a lot of those things. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different moments and hopefully, you know, more in the future. That's, that's the goal obviously is to win the world series. So I think they're making the right moves. I'm a bit, I, I don't know if you knew this. I was a big Mets fan. I am a big Mets fan. Um, but I think they're making the right moves. Uh, I didn't really have this question, but has there been any big difference for you with the change in ownership when it comes to work? Maybe they're um, giving you a bonus cause the guy's a billionaire, you know, or making, making it a little easier on you with more available in, uh, money to help with everything so right now what i've learned um you know i was i was in in la right after an ownership change and san diego there was one happened right after i left and it usually takes a little bit of time um so some of the some of the people that have have come back in you know i i worked for i've worked with them before and it's and it's uh it's been a pleasure um you know it's it's just, it's a little bit different and, you know, it's, it's hard to tell right now because we're still kind of going through that, that whole COVID phase. So our front office is still actually closed. Um, at some point I'm, I'm guessing it will, it will open up, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been as far, I mean, it's, it's one homestand in, but, uh, you know, last year when the ownership change happened, all the, all the right things were done. Um, you know, people's, as I'm sure happened to everyone, you know, we, we lost, uh, we lost a percentage of salary for COVID and, you know, so that was all returned and, and things like that. Um, you know, and obviously any, any move that, uh, that makes us a better team, um, 
you know, it's always more fun when the team wins, everyone's always happier. So any move that makes us a better team is, uh, is, is going to be, um, greeted with uh, cheers, I guess. Absolutely. I know that Lindor was cheering when he got the check. Um, but, <laughs> um, we sort of wrap it up with these last two questions. Um, first the, the big thing with your career, there's so much that went into it. And again, you said horticulture sort of getting into turf and wanting to be able to work on a golf course. If there was something that you could tell yourself when you first started, and maybe it's a baseball based knowledge or something that I wouldn't say make your life easier, but something that would have helped along the way. Um, what would that have been and why? So if, if there was something that I could, I could do a little bit differently, I might explore. Um, it's, it's funny. My, my father always told me he was, he was always like, open your own business, work for yourself, open your own business, work for yourself. I obviously didn't take that path. Um, I think that's something I would definitely explore. I think, you know, there it's, and it's not to say that I haven't, I haven't been extremely lucky and, and very happy and, and uh, you know, where I am, but there, you know, there are, you you see people that have have opened their own business and whether it be, you know, a landscaping business, uh, you know, a field construction business, you know, even something, something, you know, as a, as a field maintenance business. And there is something to be said, I guess, for, for, uh, working for yourself. Um, so that would be something that, you know, I, I, am obviously well past that, that point, but, uh, but, you know, if I was, if I was younger, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of room for field construction. Um, there's, there are, there are great companies out there, but there's also a lot of companies that, uh, that aren't so great. So there's, there, there is a lot of room for improvement in that area, in our industry. Um, so that might be, that might be something, you know, spend time looking at, you know, I was, I was hyper-focused on getting, getting back to major league baseball. Um, and I was lucky that, you know, my family moved with me and, and things like that, but, uh, but there, the, you know, I, I think that would be something I would definitely look at. As a, as a different segment of the industry. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, my first time I went to school and it's easy to say it now, it's, you know, you know I, I, I took for granted what, you know, how much fun it is being in school. It's a lot of work, obviously, but I really, I really, you know, you, you, you look back and, and, uh, and there's that time at time of your life where you, you really, you know, you, sometimes you get so focused on, on what you're doing in the future that you forget to enjoy what you're doing right now. Absolutely. Um, and the, the funny thing about what you're saying, we actually kind of try and do that with our program with not at a scale that we're like leveling fields or anything, but we, we have reconstructed almost every mound in our County, maybe twice now, almost since we started four years ago um, to, we actually are about to get a 648 or uh, pro core, which I don't know how we did it, but it's happening and we're excited. <laughs> <laughs> we're over the moon for it. Um, but just going around and helping like our community. So I think that's awesome how you brought that up. So even, even little things like that, uh, I know companies that are charging thousands and thousands of dollars just to aerate one field, you know, like go invest in yeah. a $20,000 aerator guys and <laughs> make it back in five days, you know? Um, the last thing that we sort of touch base on, um, and this isn't just turf related or uh, major league baseball groundskeeper related. Um, a lot of these kids, including some that are five weeks, six weeks away from graduation, graduation, sorry, I can't talk. Um, they're about to face the world head on, whether it's college jobs, whatever it is they plan on doing, what would be your best, uh, words of advice for them? And how would you express the importance of what that advice is for them? Um, wow. That's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I think back to, um, you know, when, when I took my first job, um, 
in the independent league. And we had no building. We had no, we, we had an office offsite. They were still doing construction. And I just remember sitting in the, in the trailer that we had set up and I looked at the operations guy. I'm like, what, what are we supposed to do? And, you know, it's, um, I'm a, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big list and prioritize. And, you know, when I'm faced with a challenge that I don't know how to tackle, that's, you know, that's where, what I go back to, I'm like, you know what? All right, let me, let me start writing stuff down. And I'm, you know, it, with, with all the technology that we have, I'm still, you know, sitting there with post-its in my office, you know, writing stuff down and just trying to, trying to think of, you know, pros, cons, you know, things like that. And I feel like that's kind of helped me when I, when I don't know where to start something or when, you know, I'm faced with a little adversity, something like that. Um, it's, it's just really simplify. And it was, it was, it's something I go back to. I had a professor from Rutgers on the field and I was explaining my, you know, our fertility plan. I was like, we're doing this and we're doing this and we're doing this. And he's like, He's like, whoa, take a step back. He's like, just, you know, spray some ammonium sulfate, some quick release and things will grow back together. You know, it's, it's really just kind of take a step back, simplify, do what, you know, what your method is of, you, you really have to find your method of, of how you deal with, with these things and how you, how you face problems. Mine is, like I said, mine is, is I'll, I'll go back and I'll start making lists and, you know, doing, doing the old fashioned pros and cons. And, and when it's looking at, whether it's looking at jobs or looking at schools, um, you know, and, and just make sure you ask questions. Like that was, I, I talk about my internship with the Dodgers a lot. And I went to school with a lot of guys who did internships at top 100 courses and came back unhappy with what, what had happened because they, they are like, Oh, I dragged hose all summer. So it's, you know, you really have to ask those questions and, and prepare yourself for stuff like that, you know, and you know, if you're, if you, if you find a job, like, like I said before, um, you know, not everyone's calling is MLB. Not everyone's calling is, is NFL. You know, it's look, look what you've done here, Drew. It's, it's amazing. I, I, you know, it's not something I would, I would be able to do. Um, I'm, you know, I'm blown away when I, when I see all this stuff that, that you guys are doing. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, you know, finding your calling and asking those questions and, and, and just, you know, a lot of times simplifying. I think that's incredible advice and that uh, we really appreciate it. I really appreciate it personally. That means a lot. Um, and I want to say I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity you gave me um, in New York. Again, it was one of the best summers of my life and I can't thank you enough for that. And we're all really grateful for you taking the time today. Sorry that we had to shuffle the time around and I didn't check in early enough and whatnot. So we really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, I, I, I appreciate you guys having me on and thank you. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, this, like, like I said, this is, I, I, I think this is, these podcasts are awesome. It's a, it's a great thing you're doing. Well, we appreciate it. Good luck with States. They're going to kill it up there at Niagara Falls and, uh, go win some hockey playoffs, huh? Yeah, should be fun. <laughs>